Nikolai emailed me not too long ago when we were first starting to talk about all of this, and he said, yes, the theme of the conference will be quick and dirty. And I said, are you sure? He's like, yeah, 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 that's, you know, kind of the way we're putting the conference together. That's kind of the way that we're, you know, handling everything. And then I said, okay, but about my travel reservations, let's make sure we get those right, okay? And it was at that moment that I started to realize that there is definitely a theme here that we definitely think about quick and dirty uh, as generally it's a bad thing, right? I mean, you start doing some search, right? Edgar Dijkstra, I mean, that's a big name. Dijkstra is a big, important name in our industry. And he says, 10 years from now, when you are doing something quick and dirty, and you suddenly imagine Dijkstra standing over your shoulder, okay, first of all, that's just creepy. Dead guy over my shoulder, whispering in my ear while I code, that's... Ugh. Dijkstra would not have liked this. Well, then that would be enough immortality for me. Dijkstra's not a fan of quick and dirty. Neither is Martin Fowler. Doing things the quick and dirty way sets us up with technical debt. And he goes on to talk more about technical debt, how it's similar to financial debt. We can choose to continue paying the interest or we can pay down the principal by refactoring into better design, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Fowler doesn't seem to be a fan. There's actually uh, Foot and Yoder did a whole pattern language a number of years ago that they entitled collectively the big ball of mud. One of the patterns was throwaway code, quick and dirty code that was intended to be used only once and then discarded. Such code takes on a life of its own despite ca casual structure and poor non-existent documentation. It works, so why fix it? Keep that in mind because that'll come back later as we talk. Over time, a simple throwaway program begets a big ball of mud. The capitals, by the way, indicate the patterns that they are referencing in that language. And generally, just on a, a purely human scale, we can understand the difference where quick and dirty would not be useful, right? I mean, this is a slide I actually use in a lot of my architecture talks. But if I were to ask you, you have the building in the upper right there, you have the building in the lower left, would you build them the same way? All of you should be going like this. The one person who's going like this, out. Out. No, security. Right? Because, frankly, Project Doghouse up there in the corner, we can throw together fairly quickly, right? We grab some pieces from the scrapyard, right, for some lumber, a hammer, some nails. We sort of eyeball measure it. If the pieces don't exactly line up exactly correct, that's okay because, you know, when it's actually rainy out, dog's going to sleep on the kid's bed anyway, despite the fact that you keep telling him the dog's not allowed inside on your bed. Whereas the, the, the skyscrapers down here, if the rain gets through the roof, if a hurricane comes through and destroys the building completely, I mean, there's very definitely two very different ways to build these two buildings. And frankly, if you come to me and say, I want to build Project Doghouse by first attempting to solicit funding for tens of millions of dollars, I'm going to insist that you are either a venture capitalist or you're Russian, right? Because you don't need to do it that way. When we're building the doghouse, the quick and dirty style makes sense. But of course, nothing we really care about would live there. Right? I mean, the dog is only okay to live in the doghouse because he's going to come inside during the rain anyway. So for the most part, everybody agrees, quick and dirty, bad, go home. Right? That's the end of my keynote. Thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the rest of the conference and your 50-minute break from this point forward. <laughs> Except we don't always use the term that way. If you do some Googling, you will very quickly discover that there are some people who will talk about the quick and dirty guide, meaning it's just basically, you know, here is a, a very fast introduction. Here are the, the concepts you absolutely need to have, you know, the quick and dirty guide to, um, uh, to, to, to flutter, the quick and dirty guide to how to create a sausage, the quick and dirty guide to, I swear to God, the quick and dirty guide to a boudoir photo shoot, right? I did not expect that to come up on that Google search. And 
Urban Dictionary, I'm not going to tell you what it came up with because I would like to come back to Germany at some point in the future. But we frequently see the use of this phrase, quick and dirty, to mean either like some sort of adjective, right? That, that, an, an introductory guide to or an introduction to or some form of here is the, the summation of what you need to know about. Or I've also seen it used as a noun. Here's a quick and dirty on. If you Google quick and dirty agile, you'll actually find a five page document that the US government put together on agile. So the quick and dirty on agile is literally five pages of, of agile software methodologies and so forth. There are several quick and dirty guides available, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we definitely seem to have this idea, at least outside of the software industry, that quick and dirty isn't always bad. So that's where I kind of got the sense of the title from, that what we want is we want to be quick and dirty and right, but like most tools, this is one of those things that we really need to re-examine as opposed to just kind of, you know, leaving it out there for other people to interpret for us. To stand up here and say go-to is always harmful, Mr. Dykstra, is a good rule of thumb, but it turns out that that's only true about 80% of the time. There are cases where actually a go-to or its logical equivalent is in fact the right thing that will make code clearer. There's always exceptions to every rule. So part of what this talk is attempting to explore is when exactly is quick and dirty the right thing to do? And then from there we can talk about when it's not. Because let's be truthful, everybody's okay with quick, right? Everybody's okay with quick. Everybody likes quick, right? It's the dirty part that people turn up their noses at. <clears throat> so what does dirty actually mean in this particular context? Sets us up. This is Fowler again. Sets us up with technical debt, similar to financial debt. Technical debt incurs interest payments. What Fowler, like many of us, is alluding to when we talk about technical debt is the idea that when you approach a problem if there are a set of constructs, if the, if the code is too low level, if it doesn't have the flexibility in place, if the design isn't elegant, then I actually have to spend extra cycles figuring out where this would go. If, for example, I'm currently looking at a code and it's a sequence of if-else statements, and I'm trying to add some additional conditional logic, I have to spend a fair amount of time d diving into these if-else statements to make sure that any conditional logic I add doesn't actually change the larger scope of the logic as a whole. Whereas somebody might refactor this into a chain of responsibility or a strategy or something along those lines from the design patterns lingo. If it takes me additional time, if it requires additional cognitive load in order for me to incorporate a change, in order for me to just be able to debug the code, for example, then we consider it technical debt. And those interest payments are things that just keep coming over and over and over again until we actually fix the code for whatever definition of fix you care to use. People have made considered decision to adopt a design strategy that isn't sustainable in the longer term. Most people would say that's bad, but look at what he follows with that. Yields a short-term benefit such as making a release. See, there are times when you do have constraints upon you that really have nothing to do with the elegance of the code. If you need to go live tomorrow because your company is about to run a commercial during the biggest sports event that your nation will see, this actually happened at the company where I'm currently working, Quicken Loans. They were getting ready to roll out a Super Bowl commercial. Now, Super Bowl, you know, may not be a big deal to folks in Germany. That's a huge deal to the folks in the U.S. That's like our World Cup, right? Except it's better because it's all American. Right, because America is the world. You guys understood that, right? Right. And you have to ship. You cannot pick up the phone and call the commissioner of the National Football League and say, hey, we need another 24 hours to make sure the code is elegant before we actually get the website up and running. Can you push the Super Bowl back by a day? 
Thanks, we'd really appreciate that. You don't have that flexibility. The world doesn't care how elegant your code is. The world doesn't care how beautiful, whether or not you've eliminated the technical debt. The world will only care whether or not they can see your website. And so in some cases, we will take that debt on, we will take that pain on in order to meet a shorter term benefit like releasing on time. The debt metaphor reminds us about the choices we can make with design flaws. The useful distinction isn't between debt or non-debt, but between prudent and reckless debt. Fowler actually draws this out into a four-cell quadrant where he has deliberate and reckless on one axis, and in, or, uh, uh, prudent, I'm sorry, deliberate and inadvertent on one axis and prudent and reckless on the other axis. In other words, there are times when we will deliberately say we totally understand what we are accepting when we add this technical debt. It's very much like financial debt. You say, you know what, I totally understand that if I go and purchase a house, which half a million dollars US later, I mean, there's no way I'm gonna have that kind of money in my bank account anytime in the future, so I'll go out and take out a loan, a mortgage loan. The US government actually encourages that, so there's all kinds of tax benefits to doing this. This is considered prudent debt. This is good debt as far as most of the U.S. debt collection agencies are concerned. Now, if you decide to spend $500,000 on Pokemon cards because your eldest child is really into Pokemon, and you are absolutely convinced that 12 years from now you will be able to sell them on eBay for at least three quarters of a million because got to catch them all, right? And no, this isn't a personal story. It comes really close. This is reckless debt. This is debt that isn't necessarily great. You know, mo most people will not look at half a million dollars of credit card debt as, in fact, a good thing. They will see that as bad debt. And then you have deliberate versus inadvertent. In some cases, deliberate, we are deliberately signing a contract. We know that we are going to have to pay several thousand dollars a month against that mortgage, but it gets us a house and we build equity. And that allows us to borrow against uh, the, what, you know, the equity that we accumulate over time as we begin to pay this off, et cetera, et cetera. Versus reckless debt, which is, hey, I'm just going to keep using my credit card until they say no which you may laugh, but I knew a few people like that in college. As a matter of fact, I had one uh, friend who uh, declared bankruptcy no less than six times before she graduated. Yikes. The key is to understand which quadrant are you in when you make these decisions. Now, Fowler goes through a great deal of discussion here the useful distinction between debt or non-debt, but between prudent and reckless debt, is the debt you're taking a prudent one? Is the decision that you are making one that you can justify because you have a goal in mind? So, for example, if you are working part of your day job and the news comes down, we just acquired a new company. Okay, congratulations, yay us. We just bought a new company. That's awesome. We grow, we're getting bigger. New business is going to come in. Oh, and they have a database similar to ours. You can start to feel the force, right? You can start to feel the negative vibes through the force at this point. And it's starting to tickle at the back of your subconscious. You can kind of hear what's coming next. And we need to integrate these two systems. And you say, oh, shit. All right, there's several different ways to go about this. One would be to keep their database alive, and the other would be to keep your database alive. And then for any sort of duplication between the databases, run some sort of nightly job that will somehow denormalize between the two databases. And there's already a couple of you who are going, no, okay, let's not do that, right? Because that would be a case of, that would absolutely be, in some respects, the easiest thing to do in the short term, 
Let them have their database. Let us have our database. The end. The longer term, though, you're not sure how well this will sustain out. What we should do in many respects is we should actually combine the databases. We should actually pick up, and since we bought them, then we'll keep our database in place and make them adjust to us. We'll take their data and we'll incorporate it into our database, eliminating duplicates where possible and or necessary. And then they will adjust their SQL queries and connection data to talk to our database and we're all good. Except we have to incorporate their data into ours. Now, you can kind of see where this is starting to go. We need some tiny program. We need some tiny bit of software that's going to do some kind of ETL type job. That's going to take the data out of their database, transform it in such a way that it matches our schema, and then attempt to load it into our database, do throwing away any duplicates along the way. And ideally, we're going to run that once. Now, this is the very definition of throwaway code. How much energy and effort do you want to go to to make this thing look beautiful? You're only going to run this once. If you have to run it twice or three times, that is itself a red flag. Because it means that the other database still exists and it's still gathering data. And by the way, folks, let me tell you that refactoring in an enterprise scenario is not just about how quickly or how much do we change the code. Real refactoring is only successful if you can delete tables. If you cannot delete a table, it means that people are still using it and you haven't refactored anything. So if we want to delete the tables, we've got to pull the data over. We want to run this job once. Now, do you really care what the code is written in at that point? Let's assume that everybody in the company is Java. Do you care if that script is written in Ruby? Do you care if it's written in .NET, PowerShell even? I would even suggest that you would not care if it were written in Oh, this hurts. Pearl. Ugh. Wow, that hurt. Oh, shit, they're recording this. Yeah, crap. Well, yeah, I mean, if you've got a developer on staff who's really, really talented with Pearl, and he's able to slam this script out, and it works, and then we can delete the tables, and we can delete this script, win. See, this is a case where we understand that the window for using this particular thing is so small, the use case for this thing is so single purpose, that, yeah, we go into this believing very strongly this is the one and only time this thing will be run. Is, it, is this debt a prudent one? Well, if we kept this script around forever, yeah, that would not be a great case, because if it's written in Perl, well, there is no such thing as maintainable Perl code. Do you have a plan for paying it off? Yeah, we're going to delete the other database and we're going to delete this script. Matter of fact, we're not even going to put it into source control. We're going to delete the source control. We'll delete all of GitHub if we have to, just to make sure this Perl script can never be recovered. Because that's the key thing around a lot of these technical debt scenarios is not the actual writing of the code up front. It's the fact that you left it around for too long. In the United States, when you go to the grocery store, printed on the side of the milk carton is a date. We call it the sell-by date. I don't know if there's a similar concept. I haven't been shopping in Germany in quite some time. The idea, though, is very simple. You do not buy milk that is past its sell-by date. As a matter of fact, grocery store is legally, like, you know, suable if they try to sell you milk that is past the sell-by date. Software intrinsically has a sell-by date. Pearl's sell-by date was about five years ago. But even so, we can still use it for some fairly one-off things. The way in which you approach software will extend that sell-by date, but if less you are deliberately trying to create something that will stand for the ages, you don't have to worry about it as long as you know how to pay off the debt. 
Throwaway is quick and dirty code that was intended to be used only once and then discarded. Keep that in mind. Used only once and then discarded. Such code often takes on a life of its own. It works, so why fix it? That's the point where you as a developer have to reevaluate. Because let's be clear, it's often not the developer that says, it's not broken, let's just leave it. It's frequently people who don't understand the concept of technical debt, who don't understand the concept of throwaway code. <clears throat> Management. <clears throat> right? And so there you'll have to explain to them that this was in fact, and there's some great videos out there of like, you know, rednecks, Americans from the South who decide that air conditioning in this particular case means let's put a, a kitchen fan right here in the car window and then run a cable around to the car battery so that way we can get air conditioning in the back seat. It'll work for a little while. Or better yet, the best way to extend a ladder is to prop it up on two other ladders. That'll work once or twice. I would not want to try it beyond that. The quickest, easy, the quickest way to address it might be to expediently modify this working code rather than design a proper general program from the ground up. Over time, a simple throwaway pro program begets a big ball of mud. Some of this is art. You have to be willing to say, well, yeah, we're getting a third company and their database is similar to the second company. And so, yeah, in this case, we can resuscitate that old Perl script. But now if we buy a fourth company and a fifth company, we might want to start rethinking these throwaway scripts. We might want to start thinking about a more generalized ETL type tool. But cross that bridge when you get to it. The other thing, while I was doing some research for this particular talk, I ran across the most fascinating article. And as much as I wanted to throw it away, <clears throat> pun intended, there's a lot of points in here that make sense. Basically, Business doesn't care if the code survives. We live in an age of throwaway software systems. There's a lot of places where a company, if they get three to five years out of the software system that you're building, they're actually quite content with that. We have reached a point where rather than expecting that IT programmers, consultants, whomever, rather than building something and then saying, we're done, walk away, and it will just continue to work for however long it needs to work. That was very much the mentality of a lot of the software systems back in the 60s and 70s. But by now, most companies have reached a point where they're like, to hell with it. I'm going to have developers as a part of my corporate cost structure. They're always going to be some percentage of how we do business. And frankly, if they ever got done with a particular program, I would have nothing for them to do. So the idea of them rewriting the same systems every five years or so, not a problem. We're actually okay with that. And by this, we don't have to worry about trying to create something that will last the ages. Because let's be clear, technology doesn't last the ages. The Java programming language is only now old enough to be able to drink. It just turned 21 not that long ago. And please point to me a Java system that has been running for 21 years. Because if you do, it's applets. You're pointing at applets. Is there anyone here who has a 21-year-old applet in production today? Show of hands. Nobody. One guy in the back. And he's being a smart ass? Yeah, he's being a smart ass. What's that? You started in the 80s. Okay, but do you have a Java applet that's in production? You do. Where is it? I got it. I got it. Sorry. Keynote on pause. Where is this applet? What does it do? It's sold by a company in Munich called AAD Secret, and they started this program some years ago, and they sell it now. They sell an applet. It's not an applet. It's uh, scripting for, uh, it's running now in HP software. But it's not an applet. It's a kind of applet. Yeah. It's a kind of applet, but is it an applet? Does it descend from Java AWT applet? Yes or no? No. Okay. Moving on. So I'm still right. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> if you're being right, 
question? Can I repeat the well, well, I did repeat the question, but no, I didn't want to say the company name in case they wanted to fire the guy afterwards. So, so the point being simply that, I mean, if we go back and look at Java 1.0, you go back and look at code that was written back in 1995. Today, it's very much considered legacy code. Right? As a matter of fact, code that was written in 2006 will be considered legacy code. Servlets and JSP and Model 2 and so forth. We're all about the spring boot these days, right? My point is that there is actually a certain amount of logic to this because if we are constantly reinventing the stack, even if we're talking about you know, the, the same platform, Every five to 10 years, Java comes out with a new notion of how we build software and everyone goes, ooh, I gotta do some of that, right? Then suddenly we wanna throw away and rewrite all of that code and we're back to the idea of, we really don't need to build something to stand the test of time because we're just gonna rewrite it in five years anyway. On top of which, we now have a methodology that everybody wants to embrace. Of course, I refer to Agile. Is there anyone in this room who will openly admit that they don't want to be Agile? They prefer to be Waterfall, show of hands. Nope, nobody, okay, cool. So we all want to be Agile, which means we all of us are totally okay with the idea that we don't have a bloody clue what it is we're trying to build. We'll figure it out as time goes on. Because that's the whole point of all these iterations, right? We start with something, we get something out the door, the customer says, I like it, or the customer says, no, that's not what I meant. And we say, fine, we can throw out that iteration or we can pivot or we can do a variety of different things. But we already understand that we don't know what we're gonna build, we're just kind of making it up as we go along. Hopefully the customer is with us as we're making it up as we go along. That's what we refer to as that notion of agile iterations, the customer on site, et cetera, et cetera but it forces us to embrace the idea that we don't know ahead of time what it is we're building. Because very bluntly, the amount of time it would take to figure it out is too long and we want to deliver business value in the meantime. So by the very definition of Agile, we are deliberately saying, yeah, we're not sure. We may need to refactor all of this later. And notice how I use the term. I say refactor all of this when what I really mean is throw it all away and start over. It seems laughable on the surface of it, but the deeper you dig into this and the more time you spend in the enterprise software world, the more traction this idea actually has. And so something to think about, particularly when you start thinking about the next system that you build, are you really building something that will still be in production 10 years from now deliberately? And if so, then what would you do to make sure that it will outlive whatever changes come down the road? Because that's usually what happened. The business, or I'm sorry, the technology, the industry pivots in a way that we didn't anticipate. How many people saw smartphones back when they looked at the first Windows phones and said, oh yeah, this is you know Windows Mobile Edition, right? The Palm device and so This is so totally gonna be the next client that everybody's going to use. We looked at it and we said, yeah, that's pretty cool, but what does the palm device, how, does, it, does it look at all like an iPhone? The nature of the industry as a whole is gonna force us to rethink everything five to 10 years, so why bother trying to build something to last 20 or more? How many people are familiar with the company 37 Signals? Fair number of hands. If you're in the Ruby space, you know these guys. They're actually the ones who created Basecamp. They had an interesting article up on Inc the business site. When we work at something, we pay careful attention to the details and take the time to polish every little thing until it's just right. We are known for a focus on quality. We take that reputation very seriously. It turns out that that's a problem. We recently began exploring an idea for a new software product. This sounds pretty familiar, right? Somebody's got an idea. Nikolai even mentioned it. We want to get to a minimum viable product. We want to get to something that vets the idea. We want to get to something that will verify that this idea has any sort of legs to it whatsoever. Will people use this? Will people buy this? Will people want this, etc.? For six weeks, we sketched out a bunch of ideas, 
All of us were excited and working hard, but a week later, we had almost nothing to show for our effort. Two months had passed since we set out to test our idea, and we still had no idea if it would work. What happened was we forgot we were just building a quick and dirty demo for ourselves. They go on to say, basically, that yes, you basically, as a company, you become what you practice. This is something that we see echoed in a lot of sporting uh, metaphors. You're, you're basically only as good as you practice. Coaches will tell you that when you are out on a practice field, you should practice just as hard as you would in a regular game. Because when you get into a game situation, what you do in practice is exactly what you will do in the game because muscle memory, because reflex and so forth. And when you don't actually use that quick and dirty muscle, you lose it very quickly. The lean startup world embraces this notion of the minimum viable product, smallest set of features possible that still allows a customer to purchase a particular thing. So for example, this conference, I mean, let's be blunt, it is a minimum viable product. You guys don't have a fancy mobile app that will show you the schedule. You guys don't have, you know, like this really fascinating vendor space where you've got all these sorts of, you know, artificial intelligence robots and drones and so forth. You've got a guy on a stage who thinks he knows what he's talking about. And it works. Matter of fact, if the AV had completely fallen apart, that would suck, but that's not the point. The point of the conference is getting people in a room that you want to listen to. These guys were focused on what exactly their minimum viable product was, and they carried it out to that distance. And if it turns out that nobody had actually bought tickets to this event, well, then, you know, the speakers get a lovely couple of days in Karlsruhe on somebody else's dime, and we, disturb, we discovered that this product doesn't work. But judging from the, from the you know, numbers of people in the audience, there's something here. And so now they can take this and they can go think about it and figure out how they want to do it better next time. But in the lean world, in the startup world, they talk about the minimum viable product as getting you to customer number one, and then getting you to customer number 10, and then getting you to customer number 100. And in some cases, Many, many startup advisors will say, this may not mean doing anything with software at all. If you're trying to sell something, could you sell it without the app? Could you connect people? Think about Airbnb. Could I connect a renter and a consumer without having built an app? Sure I could, because I happen to know somebody who's got a house that they're willing to rent out, and I happen to know somebody who wants to be on vacation. And so I could literally connect the two with me being the human broker in the middle as opposed to there being an app broker in the middle. That's the minimum viable product for Airbnb. The point is you keep it lean. You keep it the smallest possible thing that could work. The extreme programming folks actually had a phrase for this. The simplest thing possible or the simplest thing that could possibly work depending upon who you talk to at what time in the XP world. Obsessing about quality too early in the creative process prevents a lot of good ideas from taking shape. I will suggest that it's not just quality. Obsessing about any particular itty, obsessing about the scalability, obsessing about the security, obsessing about anything that's not just the pure feature play in the very earliest stages of an idea can kill it. Now, in some cases, you might say, well, but the whole idea is built around the idea of scale and whatnot. Maybe those are edge cases we'd have to discuss that, preferably over beer. When you're first ideating, when you're first gestating this idea in your head, when you're first talking about it with your friends, when you are first creating this thing, you need to keep a distinct and clear focus on what it is you're trying to do. You're trying to get that first version out the door. As a result, the wrong sets of pressures are brought to bear, doubts, deadlines, resource planning, all of this stuff is essential, but only later on once you've proven that the idea actually has 
merit. Once you've run the conference and you've gotten people here and you've built a small amount of momentum that you can carry over into your second event and your third event, it only happens after you get that first one out of the way. I see startups overthinking simple problems, adding too much structure too early and trying to get too formal too soon. Startups should embrace their scrappiness. And by scrappiness, we mean that willingness to just grab things, duct tape, bailing wire, slam it together, get it out the door. Let's make it work. At Quicken Loans, the place where I currently work, we have as part of our culture, we have a set of 17 isms. These are phrases that the original founder, a guy by the name of Dan Gilbert, who is now richer than God, he likes to use on a regular basis. And one of the isms that they toss off on a regular basis, which I heartily believe in, is we'll figure it out. We don't need to have all of the solution figured out at the time we start. We can bring a lot of this to bear later. Let's get something out the door now. And any problems that come up later, we'll figure it out. Part of this goes back to prototyping. Often in the software space, when you say prototype, developers go, ah, because we have this fear. Everybody knows this story. Boss comes into your office one day and says, hey, the marketing folk, they want you to put together a quick prototype of a particular blah, 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 blah. They want you to do a prototype mobile app. They want you to do a prototype website. They want you to do a prototype watch app, whatever. Just by the end of the week. And you're like, okay, cool, I can do that, no problem. I've wanted to learn how to do Apple Watch iOS for some time anyway. So you sit down, you read a couple tutorials, you go through the process, you build your prototype, and then come Friday, your boss and the two folks from marketing come in, and you show them your prototype. And they are really impressed. They really like your prototype. Some of you are smiling. You know where this is going, don't you? And like an action star in a movie, you can start to see it right before it's too late because you're like, Nrrr. and they say, ship it. Let's use this. This is awesome. They turn to your boss. You have great people. You're like, what did he have to do with it? I'm the one who did the work. But no, you can't ship this. You absolutely cannot ship this. This is a terrible idea. <sighs> but they do. And now you're on this mission-critical project forever. So then what happens? The next time somebody comes to you and says, hey, I want you to build for me a prototype, you say, I've seen this movie. I've lived this movie, maybe, but most of us actually haven't been through this scenario. Most of us have just heard about it from a friend, right? It's like the programmer force again. So your boss walks in, I want to prototype, and you can feel 50 million anguished souls all crying out at once. These are the programmers who lost their lives to prototypes that went into production. You know how this story ends. And so you immediately set out to do the exact opposite of quick and dirty. I will make this thing be a testament to the ages. Look upon my works, ye mighty, and despair. And your boss says, all I wanted was a prototype and you haven't even finished with a hello world screen. You're fired. And you're like, that's fine because I knew how this was going to end anyway. I quit. What happened there? We lost sight of what a prototype was intended to do. A prototype is, should actually be a fairly straightforward thing to do. Set a hypothesis and then set out to prove that one way or another. And if this isn't what prototyping means, then you have a problem. That's the whole point of prototypes. UI and UX folks, they will use the term prototype. What they really mean is a design. What they really mean is a guide. This is what we want you to build for us. Let's go back to the notion of iterations here for a second. The Agile Manifesto really likes the notion of iterations, doing things in sequence over and over and over again. Responding to change over following a plan, working software as the primary measure of progress, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody's pretty much okay with the idea of iterations. 
Iterative process is one that makes progress through successive refinement. Development team takes a first cut at the system knowing it is incomplete or weak. Hear what's going on there? We don't know what we're doing, but we're going to take a stab at it anyway. Turns out that we were not the first to come up with this. And as a matter of fact, there's a gentleman by the name of John Boyd who was a researcher and philosopher working for the U.S. Air Force, of all places. Came up with what was known as the OODA loop. The Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act loop. It's a four-part loop. He was talking about modern fighter combat, where, in fact, if I'm a fighter pilot and I'm trying to shoot Nikolai down, then I need to observe, I need to orient, I need to decide and then act in response to the things that he is doing. Now, it turns out, Boyd basically came to a form that this is the idea that all things go through, whether you're in a fighter plane or whether you're actually researching something in science. He's got diagrams where he talked about how the same thing happens. And if you think about it in science, we, ob we, we observe, okay, this happened. We orient, all right, this is the thing I really want to explore deeper. We decide, this is the experiment I want to run. We act, I run the experiment. That generates some data, some results, at which point I observe again. But Boyd's loop is actually really critical because what he said is it's not important to just go through the loop. It's important to get inside your opponent's loop. Now, in Boyd's case, we're talking about a directly competitive scenario. If me and Nikolai are currently trying to shoot each other down, it's absolutely critical for me to get inside of his loop. If I can observe, orient, decide, and act before he can, then I will be responding quicker than he can. And before he even makes a move, I will have made a move to counter it. I want to get inside of his loop, is the way that Boyd phrased it. It's not the loop that's critical. It's the speed of the loop. If I can go through my loop twice before he can go through his loop once, I guarantee you that I will win the battle. Because while he's in the middle of deciding, I will observe, orient, decide, and act before he even gets a chance to observe the results of his action, I will win. And this is true of any competitive scenario. This is true in sport. This is true in science. This is true in everything. We want feedback quickly which you can't do unless you've got something going. Going back to the Inc. article, the ability to run with scissors is a blessing, not a curse. You need that feedback. That initial iteration is your first run. It's your first feedback. And sometimes it's absolutely good enough. If the first iteration succeeds, great. Stop. Don't build it again. Don't improve it. Don't refactor it. Part of the problem is you, you sitting in these chairs. How many people here want to be known as a hack? How many people here want to be known as somebody who just throws shit together and, and gets it to work, but then cares nothing at all about elegance? How many of you would gleefully, yeah, I've got one guy who's like, well, maybe. Most of us prefer to think of ourselves as elegant craftsmen. Right? Complete with the nose in the air. We are craftsmen. We are artisans. We produce beauty and elegance. Right? And the idea of just slamming something out in the quick and dirty style ugh, turns us off. But it's a tool, folks. And if you take away the nuance around how terrible quick and dirty is and you realize it's just a tool, now, all of a sudden, you can start thinking about it as a tool as opposed to an, a, an outcome to be avoided. Don't let your ego get in the way. When do we abandon the quick and dirty design? There's a bunch of criteria. You could probably figure it out for yourself. The fact of the matter is, to me, it's a rule of three thing. If I find that I have to use this throwaway thing more, more than twice, time to rethink it. Time to actually consider building something that will have better ability to pivot, better ability to adjust. 
And let me be very, very clear. Nobody, not me, nobody is suggesting that quick and dirty is better than creating real software engineering. But it is a tool. And it does get you that first iteration and it does get you that feedback, and sometimes it is exactly what the problem calls for. So go, be quick, get a little dirty, and be okay with that. Peace.